All right, everyone, it's time for a break in our regular program. We're gonna tackle some of the issues that we find ourselves dealing with in these super, super strange COVID-19 times, you've got to admit. Now, for most of us in lockdown, I suspect, or at least this is my personal experience anyway, we're all struggling a little bit to come to terms with some of those huge changes that this has had on all of our lives. Now, one of the first things that goes out the window when you're stressed is nutrition. And if you're like me, you've probably done a little bit too much of going back and forward to the fridge too many times, or maybe resorting to too much takeaway food. But there's a reason why we do this. To set us straight on what we can do to minimise some of the emotional eating, which, well, helps keep our mental health in check in the process. I'm joined by a panel of experts and they are very knowledgeable in this field. They know a thing or two about this very subject. I've got psychologist Franco Greco, nutritionist Carolyn Jones, and from the AFLW, not only someone who does sport at an elite level, she's currently on the front line as a nurse treating COVID-19 patients, North Melbourne's finest, Tani Nesta. I'll start with you, Franco, from the psychologist's perspective. What is emotional eating and why do we do it? I guess in a crisis point, um, when you're highly stressed, one of the first things that changes is actually your eating behaviour. And uh, it's actually, there's physiological and there's psychological reasons why we do that. Um, one is that the body tends to crave sort of high, high calorie and high sugar foods during stressful times. Um, and these, these foods provide sort of short term bursts of energy. And these sugary sort of foods also generate dopamine, which is a neurotransmitter associated with motivation and reward. And, um, and it just distracts us and it gives us that reward in the short term and, um, and helps us deal with negative emotions at a time when you're feeling low or stressed um, or anxious. Yeah. So what effect can this emotional eating have on our mental health? Well, it's actually quite interesting that you ask that question. So we, we tend to overeat um, and eat uh, processed foods. Um, and, in, and I guess one of the key things around that is, is associated with this lack of control or lack of certainty, which is probably all the things we're sort of experiencing now. Um, so when you're associated with that, what happens is that it can lead to or be associated with depression because uh, you feel guilty about it as well. Uh, you, tend to, you tend to ruminate on it. You, can, you tend to think a lot about you know, the fact that I'm overeating or you tend to be more conscious of it. Um, and that can lead to more, be feeling more anxious. Franco, it's like you're reading my mind right now when you say all of this, and I'm sure I'm not alone. But, no. Carolyn, um, I'll go to you now. You're a canteen advisor and a nutritionist, and you would see every day the effect that good eating has on kids. What's the most important thing for kids and adults, I think, at this time? And even, um, is it as simple as keeping a routine? It's... it's well, keeping a routine is tricky in this time. And, you know, we've, we've, we've never experienced anything like this. Um, you've got families at home. You've got parents at home that may or may not be working. Um, you've got kids at home um, that are trying to homeschool um, and parents who are not teachers. I think it's important that they understand that they're not teachers and it's not homeschooling. It's just learning from home. Um, so to set up that routine, to go so far as to, um, you know, make lunch boxes that you would make normally for a kid going to school, have that, you know, get up in the morning, have the shower, have your breakfast together, um, have your workspaces set out. But, you know, do, do the things like have what you normally have in your lunch box, have that set out for the kids and have a recess time and a lunch time and, and an afternoon tea have those breaks with a bit of, um, you know, uh, a PE lesson in there, you know, so that you're breaking it up so that the routine is like a school routine and the foods are like the, the foods that you will eat at school. I think that's um, really important to help because the, the minute the little kids start seeing that you're stressing about things, mm -hmm. they'll stress even more because they're out of control, you know, and they don't know, they don't have the rational thought that we have to be able to know that it's going to end. We still don't know when, but... You know, the kids are going to feed off that and become more stressed. Mm -hmm. So the, the structure is definitely really important. So, Carolyn, routine helps kids. Can we apply that to our lives as well as adults? Should we yeah. be getting up and making our own lunch boxes? <laughs> it depends on how you would normally do things for work anyway, but definitely. And, and, and putting into your fridge 
a lot of a lot more of the the fresh foods and the you know for for um my my daughter even mentioned to me last night having bowls of fruit around is much easier for her to then not go and you know eat some processed cereal or something like that she feels better about that now that applies to adults as well you know of course we can just go and grab you know a, some sort of processed meal and um and it, like you said feel guilty about it later um but i think the, it's important to to keep the structure of the of the three meals a day kind of attitude if that's how you do it whatever you are used to doing try to keep that happening but also don't disallow yourself from having the takeaway but don't have it every night you know yeah. that's the ritual part of it you might have a friday night like fish and chips that might might have been your ritual before Keep that going so that that normality stays as well. And then don't feel guilty about having it. I want to get on to the ritual of, of eating and how that can help in times like this when we are stressed and we are really anxious. So I'll get back to you on, on that, Carolyn, and also Franco. But Tani, great, great to meet you, albeit via video chat. Um, you're an AFLW player for North Melbourne. You're a nurse on the front line. You're treating patients with COVID-19. What is your life like right now? Uh, it is very different right now from what it has been previously. Um, we probably would have just finished our season or would be coming to the end of our season at the moment. Um, and it was dramatically cut short. Um, so our life has changed dramatically. Um, mine in terms of I still go to work. Um, and I still do uh, my normal shifts, uh, but a lot of the girls, they've now, you know, they've lost footy and they've lost their job. So um, that's even more difficult. Um, but yeah, our life, our life has dramatically changed. Um, going to work is even very different. Um, we're used to, you know, not knowing uh, what we are going to see when we go to work, being an emergency department. Um, but with COVID-19, our department's changed dramatically within itself. So there's a whole unknown of what's to come in the next couple of weeks as well. So how are your stress and anxiety levels at this point? You're dealing with it every day, not just a change in your daily routine and a change in your physical routine. You're dealing with going to work in a, a potentially dangerous workplace. Yeah, to be honest, they have been a little bit up and down. It is um, quite stressful. Um, we have been quite anxious. Um, but getting back to the little things, and it is routine that I'm finding really important, um, sleep pattern um, is very, very important. And um, creating a routine that will then help me get to sleep and get the proper night's sleep that I that I will require prior to going to work. Um, those things like structuring meals as well, doing and structuring our training around that. So we're still trying to do our training uh, and keep fit. Um, meditation I've been including um, girls from work are putting on yoga classes so we do now have time when we're at home to do these things that we would have probably liked to have done previously to maintain a really um, good balance of wellness within us um, so having these days off where we are stuck at home it does allow us time to you know do yoga some meditation in the morning um, and plan our day around that I've found that to be really helpful and useful to alleviate the stress at the moment yeah and Tani I imagine you go from having a very specific diet when you're training and you're in season so now what's in your fridge now that all bets are off and everything's gone out the window like I, I'm interested to hear what a, a person of, of your elite sports level does at this point do you still try and stay healthy and keep fresh stuff like Carolyn suggested or does it all kind of go out the window no, absolutely. Um, it's still a lot of fresh stuff in the fridge and I'm finding it's, it's better now. I've got more time to prepare my meals for the week. Um, I've got more time to decide what I want, then go to the supermarket, have it all there ready to go and time to prepare it. Um, it's also been good um, being home. I'm not at training as much now, so I'm able to prepare meals with my housemates and sit down and actually enjoy it. Whereas usually we'd be at training for a couple of hours and then we might get... Um, a nicely made up meal from our nutritionist to have on the way home. Um, so it's very different in that, that aspect and I've, I'm actually really enjoying it. That's good to hear. Well, I think we're all learning a lot about ourselves in this time. What are we learning predominantly, Franco, about how we deal with stress and anxiety in times like this? Well, I guess, I guess the key question there really lies on well, what, are the, what are your normal coping mechanisms? And so, so people have these normal coping mechanisms. They connect with people. 
um, in a way they go out, uh, they exercise. Um, um, I mean, sometimes they get to go to work. Work going to work is actually quite a good way of relieving stress as well. Um, so all the usual things that we normally do is now sort of out the window a little bit. So it's all been disrupted. So 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 now you're sort of relying to things internally. So so adjusting to the new normal, um, how long this normal is going to be, is one of the key factors associated with how to better manage anxiety, stress, depression, or any other type of mental health issues that you have. Yeah. What would you suggest would be some really good, some really useful coping mechanisms for people right now, like me, going back to the fridge all the time, thinking about food all the time because I'm stuck in my house and I can see it over there. How do we, how do we cope? Yeah, really good question. Um, it goes back to some of the questions, some of the answers that Caroline and Tanya gave earlier, which is really around sticking to a routine um, or at least developing one. Um, one of the things that really, really quite clear in the research is that over extended periods of time people spend at home, actually um, spending time together in a meal would be really useful. Uh, so that gives some structure as well to the day. Um, so having a daily household meals, for example, um, and uh, so, you know, we normally would spend time away from work, at work. So now we're all spending days at, at home, working from home. Um, so, so having a structure like that, um, have a lunch, have a, an afternoon tea, if that's what you do. But having a meal together with your family is quite important. For people that I'm most concerned about is people that really don't have anyone really to connect with at home. Uh, you know, you, you're an elderly person or you live in a single household. Um, finding ways in which to connect with people during those times as well. Um, now, we're coming up to Easter. There'll be a lot of people in Easter that wouldn't be normally celebrating together. So how do you... How do you establish that that that, that level of um, celebrating events like Easter, birthdays, um, other types of events that you normally would do with other people? So finding creative ways of doing that would be quite useful as well. Another part also is probably thinking about what are my triggers. So we all got different types of triggers. What are they? Yeah, it'd be interesting to find out what your triggers are. But you know, my, my triggers is really about you know I work I worked at a kitchen bench. Uh, I found that in the first week I was working at a kitchen bench and finding my accessibility to the food was actually quite <laughs> quite easy. Um, so uh, to find in a space where you're going to say, well, you know, it's away from the kitchen, it's uh, it's not it's not near a cupboard, it's not where, where food is and there's a bit of a distance there, it could be quite useful for me. But there might be different triggers for different people. Yeah, probably mine is just looking at the fridge directly <laughs> as I'm speaking to you right now. That's probably not good for me. Franco, you mentioned ritual and tradition. And that's important, especially at times like this, where we're in the middle of Easter. For some people, they celebrate it, others don't. But it's nice to get together with family, however you celebrate it. And Carolyn, you've written a beautiful article that's on the Recharge Victoria website about that tradition of family dinners and, and suggested that maybe that's something that we could introduce now because a lot of families don't even have family dinners. Absolutely. And, and I 100%, I think out of this terrible time that we're going through, that's something, it's, I think there's this resetting that um, we can all sort of start to um, experience. We can start some of those rituals. We can start um, getting the kids involved. If you've got kids around, kids involved cooking, um, preparing meals. Kids are more likely to try new things if they've been part of making, you know, making the food. Now is not a time to try to make kids eat new food. You don't want stressful meal times. You don't want to be arguing. You want it to be a, a positive social experience. Um, and also, um, you know, Franco said before about, um, you know, people who are on their own or people who are elderly or, or going through, especially around times like Easter where they'd normally be surrounded by family. Um, we even to talk about having like FaceTime uh, dinners with our families. I've got families in three different states. We, we normally spend Easter, all the cousins spend Easter together and we're doing a virtual Easter egg hunt tomorrow. And we've got, you know, there are cousins that are 25 years old. You know, we still do that every year, usually in Byron Bay. And, um, and so, you know, we, we're gonna do that in a virtual way. And I think that's a, um, a nice, you know, we, we're continuing our holiday ritual, but we're doing it in, this new normal yeah. um, with the, with the uh, you know, um, the Easter egg hunt. So, you know, things like that, um, they're, they're good memories to have, they're good memories to create. 
and, and again, create, uh, creating food together, eating together. When kids create food, I've done many workshops teaching kids how to cook. And um, when they create the food themselves, they're so proud of it and they will, they will ask for that positive feedback, you know, constantly and it can, you know, get a bit annoying sometimes, you know, you say, <laughs> yes, I do like the broccoli you just cooked or whatever. Um, keep, keep that positive feedback happening. And then once all this is over, you'll find they, they want to be part of that a bit more, you know, so they'll take, you know, the control of some of that stuff that we're usually too rushed to, to involve them. Yeah. Such a great idea, I think. And not just for the kids to get involved, but for the, the elderly and vulnerable too, because I, from what I've read, that's the first thing to go out the window too, nutrition for the oh, elderly and their routines. And it's the old um, having toast for dinner. That's yeah. behind a lot of the elderly, especially if they've become widowed or, 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 um, or for some reason they're now on their own, they will, they'll often just make something very simple, like a piece of toast mm. for dinner. Now that's not obviously sustainable might be you know one or two nights you could get away with that but yeah it's hard to cook for one person Tani what are you doing in lockdown are you uh, it, 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 I don't want to be personal or anything but like are you in a, a are you alone do you have someone there uh, or are you communicating online with friends what are you doing yeah so I live in a shared house so I have three other uh, housemates uh, so I do get to see them um, and interact with them um, obviously, because I'm well uh, at the moment, um, and so are all they. Um, so I'm able to interact with them, which is really nice. We can have dinner together. Um, we're often sitting down after dinner, um, after we've all done the dishes together and watching a movie. Um, I can FaceTime my parents. Um, they're from back home there in Ballarat, um, and they've learnt to use FaceTime now, um, ringing my nan and pop. Unfortunately, their phones are um, quite old Nokias, so they don't have FaceTime, but it's still good to call them um, and just check in on them, see how they're going. They're not leaving at the, ha the house at the moment, um, which is really nice. Yeah. And in terms of establishing traditions and routines in your household, you've said you've, you've organised like family dinners almost. Do you find that that lifts the mood and lifts everybody's um, feelings of wellbeing? From my point of view, like going to work all day um it can be extremely isolating to come home and have to stay in your home you know your own room or something like that um so to be able to create a meal together um you know discuss events of the day um things like that it's really nice which is is something i suppose um i didn't get as much time to do um with football um i'd be going from work straight to training i'd see the girls um but in terms of sitting down for a meal with people during the week um i didn't do that very often um so that's something that i've really actually enjoyed um despite these hard times that are stressful i think it's something that going forward i would like to put into my life a bit more do you think franco that we're going to learn something from this period in terms of our own mental well-being and our the things that we we put into our body and how that affects us do you think given the time that we have to reflect on this given we're locked at home do you think we'll change moving forward yeah really good question um i was talking to uh, dr rob gordon who does a lot of work around trauma trauma related events and professor um david forbes from phoenix australia last week about this exact issue about the capacity to reset um and it goes back to this issue around people reflecting on their values reflecting back on their what's important to them uh, and they found that in the context of a lot of uh, other events like bushfires or earthquakes or other traumatic events for people individually and this is a, a, a broader societal change uh, the impact that's happening and i think it goes back to some of the the, the things that uh, caroline and tani talked to which is really um, being able to uh, spend time with people in a way that you haven't normally spent time together and making better connections with people. Um, it's happening right now. We're talking amongst three people, four people um, that we normally wouldn't have spoken about this. So it creates different types of connections. Um, I think the, the opportunity there is always there to sort of respond to this in a way of reflecting about what's really important. And I think that's probably where, I see this a lot of my own clients that I see uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, people who would normally have be very anxious. Now, they're, they're still anxious, but they're actually saying, actually, it's a shared anxiousness they're sharing now with other people. 
Um, so it's a very interesting sort of time to reflect on, on the connectedness in a way that we haven't really in the past. And hopefully that will have some sort of ongoing effect in terms of the way we live our lives in the next, the next bit. Um, have you felt any anxiety? I mean, this is your field. Is, is this something that has made you personally anxious, Franco? I get anxious as well, and it's and it's, and it's disruptive. So I I, I go in and uh, have clients uh, uh, like uh, uh, every now and then. I feel, you know, what what if I catch coronavirus? What, what does it mean for me? Uh, I bring it home to my to my kids. It's probably the same thing that Tani feels when she goes into to a hospital every day. Um, and I feel that that's probably my shared level of anxiety. And 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 you bring it home in that context, and, you, and of course we're all going to experience it. I guess it's really about recognizing what triggers you. Um, uh, what what are the ways in which uh, you know can you feel more anxious when you're more likely to feel anxious? Um, and it goes back to things like uh, am I getting enough sleep? Am I getting enough uh, exercise? Am I eating the right types of food? So it goes back to that issue for me as well. So I guess I share the same human response and anxiousness that other people would experience. Some people experience it much more acutely. Um, and, uh, and I reach out to people who, who are feeling that to really go out and talk to a psychologist or to a counsellor or helpline to, uh, to, to talk to someone about how that's impacting on you as well. Well, before we wind up, I reckon I need to hear from all of you, your top tip for maintaining good nutrition in these COVID-19 times. Uh, how do I stop myself from <laughs> looking on those, on those delivery services or opening the fridge and eating something bad? What do I do? How do I do it? Prepare. Be prepared. Have stuff, cook stuff, have things in your freezer, make, make things that you can pull out and easily um, heat up if it's for dinner. Um, have... There are, there are so many, because we're such a food conscious society, there are so many websites out there now that have lots of great recipes for things that are snackable and, and are um, still sweet, you know, if, you, if you've got the sweet tooth, but still full of nutrition and um, are not hard to make. Or you can, you know, there are people selling those sorts of things, you know, quite, quite, um, quite a lot around. So, you know, those, having those sorts of things around you more often and, and distracting yourself. Distracting yeah. yourself with other things. Good advice, Carolyn. Be prepared. I love that. What about you, Tani? What do you reckon? Um, mine would probably be um, just be a bit open to this new experience. So maybe it's an opportunity to try things. Um, maybe there's things that you've wanted to make before. Um, homemade pasta. I see a lot of people this weekend have made hot cross buns. Mm. Um, so I think it's amazing. Um, and also cut up some fresh fruit, um, celery, carrots, things like that that are you can have in your fridge they're really accessible so you can just open it up and you've got healthy snacks there to go yep yep and 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 what about for you franco what's your your hot tip to good nutrition in these really quite bizarre times we find ourselves in yeah. well look you know I, I think um just be aware or when you emotionally triggered to to eat something just be aware what's going on for you emotionally so just maybe be just stop for a second and just be aware of it that's, that's what i talk to a lot of my clients about there's actually a link on an article that I'm going to be putting up as part of this, this show uh, where you can actually test how, what's your emotional eating test. So what are you, some of your triggers around that? So yeah, being aware of the triggers. Can you answer all the answers if it's a multiple choice question? Because <laughs> I think I've got so many triggers. <laughs> um, well, I've learned a lot from you all today. Thank you so much for your time. I really, really appreciate it. Um, lots of great takeaways today from this, not of the food variety, but um, lots of great takeaways, I think, for all of us to work out how we approach the next couple of months or however long it's going to be. So thank you all so much, Franco, Carolyn and uh, Tani. It's been wonderful. Thanks, Nick.